Ready? You there, boys. Once upon a time, there were four identical brothers with four very different T-shirts. The T-shirts were all nice. Only one of them was saying a lot more than the others. Who do you think would be the, the best at sport? <laughs> Whose team would you want to be on? Who do you think is the coolest? <laughs> Who would you most want to be friends with? How can that little swooshy thing mean so much? That's how powerful a fashion super brand is. I'm not talking about any old brand here. These are the huge global organisations with turnover in billions, who've not only invaded our wardrobe... Ralph Lauren, head to toe. ..they've invaded our upbringing. What would be the consequences of having the wrong brand? At school, you'll probably get picked on. ..and our minds. They have managed to tap into an emotion that is central to our lives. In hard times, we just keep buying from them. Now I'm going to find the secrets of their power. There's just one problem. So what do you think, Alex, your fashion choice says about you? Uh, I think it's, <laughs> it says that I like a bargain. You see, up till now, fashion brands have kind of passed me by. So I've got quite a lot to learn. So you're the fashion editor of uh, the fashion Daily Director. Mail? Fashion director. Of the Daily Telegraph, please. Sorry, Daily Telegraph. But I'm determined to reach the super brands in their most intimate places. This is a tomb of Addy Dashler. Try it out. This, this is the international quarters of Diesel. They might try and stop me. It's fine without the camera, so oh. we can just walk in. Nothing happens without the camera. But I'll follow their global trail and I'll find out how they get so deeply into our minds. That's one of her pleasure centres of the brain, lighting up when she sees the expensive handbags, but not when she sees the cheap ones. you got to have it or you're going to die. So let's dive into the frenzy of desire. These are gold plates and Chanel. It's about £100 still. I just want it. it. Yeah. Because I've gone native in the world of fashion. So, from Abercrombie and Fitch to the A-list Burberry show, come on, super brands, show me what you're made of. I, I've never thought that I needed brands, because if I want to make a statement about who I am, I've got jumpers. A jumper to say, hey, he's a lot of fun. A jumper to say, welcome to summer, a heavier weight for the winter. It's Raspberry, look at me. No logos, look. Ralph Lauren, Calvin Klein, Nike, Chanel, Versace, Diesel, Abercrombie and Fitch. I'm totally immune to brands. Yeah, in the bottom of my wardrobe is a pair of Adidas trainers. How did Adidas get into my wardrobe? Why didn't I buy Nike? Why didn't I buy Converse? Why did I go for a branded trainer in the first place? I mean, they all do the same thing, but why do they all feel so different? What are they doing to our minds? I think it's about time somebody went to the trouble of finding out. But it's big, the world of fashion, so where to start? I've been making some inquiries on the street. No, no, Belle, you've got the Louis Vuitton belt. Yeah, you've got, you've got a Gucci belt. Is there any... I mean, would you wear a Gucci belt? No, he wouldn't. And no. I wouldn't wear Louis Vuitton. Why not? Vuitton. Why wouldn't you wear a Gucci <laughs> belt? I don't know. It just doesn't... For me, it just doesn't... It's not smooth. I think Louis Vuitton's a bit more feminine. It's a bit more slick. Right. Yeah, that's I agree. I prefer Louis a bit more tackier. That's my look. Yeah. Right? It's a bit more tackier. I like that. How much was that? 260. For the belt. Yeah. Well, this, this was about eight quid, this one. <laughs> Still keeping my trousers up, isn't it? <laughs> That's it. I'm going to find out how Louis Vuitton gets someone to fork out 260 quid for a belt. Louis Vuitton was a building in Versailles. Gorgeous. Everyone who wants to be ostentatious and show off. Some of the things are not very expensive there. For example, trainers could be 300 pounds or so. The Louis Vuitton company started in Paris in 1854, making expensive luggage for royalty and the elite. In the last 20 years, they've branched out into luxury clothing. A coat will cost you up to 3,000 pounds and a handbag up to 50,000. Blimey. But I'm not looking for official history. I'm looking for secrets. So I've tracked down Darla Thomas, who studied luxury brands and got a bit hooked in the process. But Louis Vuitton is this incredibly amazing, unattainable, extremely expensive thing, it, isn't it? 
it's seen as that through its marketing, but it's actually very accessible. In 1977, Louis Vuitton only had two stores, and now it's an enormous business. They now have over 400 shops all over the world. It's a delicate balance of selling masses to the masses while still remaining exclusive to the, to the rich. You have a pyramid. At the top, you have the very beautifully made, exclusive, limited amount product. They will make anything you want. From there, you have the middle range that you can walk into the store and you can buy it. It's still very well made, beautiful fabrics. And then you have the bottom range where the money comes in, where they just sell masses of stuff. It could be of perfumes, wallets, belts, scarves, umbrellas, keychains, sunglasses. That's how they manage to keep people like the Sultan of Brunei, Hollywood stars, royalty as customers, as well as selling to the Chinese secretary who wants to put the bag on her desk to show that she can afford a Louis Vuitton bag. So the top of the pyramid is, is where you build the image, where you build the, the kudos, and then the rest of the pyramid is where you exploit it and turn exactly. it into cash. Exactly. That's brilliant. So even if we can't afford the top or the middle of the pyramid, we can still thread some of its reflected glory through our trouser loops. How much is that? As far as I can see, this is how most of the luxury brands work. All that super expensive, high-profile stuff that they do at the top end is just losing them money. But they're raking it in on the more affordable stuff at the bottom of this so-called pyramid. But where are they getting all this stuff from? Who's making it? I've been lucky enough to locate the place where Chanel make their £200 sunglasses. Not the old world Parisian workshop I'd imagined, it's a huge factory belonging to a company called Luxottica. This is, this is Massimo and uh, you are the chief operating officer of, of this Luxottica group. So welcome in the temple of the glasses uh, factory. Yeah. Luxottica is something of a super brand in its own right. They own Sunglass Hut, Oakley, Persol, Ray-Ban and others. Of the whole operation, how many per frames a year do you do? Uh, 55 million per year. And it turns out it isn't just Chanel that have their sunglasses made here. In fact, I've hit the luxury brand bottom of the pyramid jackpot. Who knew that all these different brands with their unique identities are all made in the same factory? I've been told that in this area, using the same materials and the same machines, you can make any number of different brands of sunglasses. Tiffany, Polo, Chanel, Dolce & Gabbana and Versace. We want every line to be able to produce any models. Yes. For example, this is this is doing polo today, but an, uh, next week it might do Ray-Ban or... Mm, next shift. Next shift it could be... Might be next, uh, half an hour. Next, next half, half an, an hour. hour. It could yeah. be any, any of the other brands. Any. And not only do Luxottica make the sunglasses for the brands, but they also help design them. Behind this wall, yeah. There is a style office, product office design, so lovely, lovely. That's uh, lovely. we're not allowed to enter. Uh, but this is where uh, all uh, the fashion brands come and together with our designer, they elaborate the sketches, they think, they readjust. So shall we just go in and, and have a look around and see what, just to get a real feel for what you are. I love the way you've described it, but it, I, to visualise it, shall we go inside I leave this and to, to have a look? Well, very strictly <laughs> confidential, so... <laughs> Look, we're all friends now. We're all friends. Yes, well, Why don't I we just go... I mean, just, just for fun, just to, just to have a look around. I mean, I'll promise not to memorise anything that I see in there, but oh, just... It's fine without the camera, so oh. we can just walk in. Nothing happens without the camera. Now, us buying into this pyramid with mass-produced goods is great for brands, but I hear it's a balancing act, because they mustn't make it too obvious that just anyone can afford them. Burberry's, Burberry's like, you know, fine wine, you know, it's, it's, it's refinement, you know, in, uh, in a British way. A statement of, of wealth. Very traditional. Elite women that love clothes. But also... Chav. Chavvy, I guess. So chavvy, I'm sorry. I'm slightly chav. Bit chavvy. Chavvy. Chavs. That's where the chav name got come from, Burberry, you know, isn't it? 
So Burberry means status and good taste for one set of people and completely the opposite for another. How did this happen? Burberry started life as a gentleman's outfitter. They invented the trench coat during World War I and it later became a must-have for the posh wardrobe, bringing Burberry huge international success. But in the 1980s, their trademark check, once reserved for the lining of the coats, began popping up all over their collections. Now you could buy a piece of old world class cheaply, the check became really popular, especially with football hooligans. When these pictures started to come out, they changed the way people saw Burberry. Certain bars and pubs would probably not, would, would not want to see that kind of check because it sort of had a low rent kind of feel about it, which was not obviously what Burberry wanted to send out as a message that any old person could wear this label. Burberry had lost control of its own image and it was starting to affect sales further up the pyramid. The trench coat lost its sense of being a kind of luxury product to own. Now, Burberry is a global company and Chavs are British, so this only affected British sales. But these days, losing the confidence of style makers in one country can spread and infect worldwide opinion. To stop the rot, Burberry brought in a new head designer, Christopher Bailey, who put the check back on the inside of the clothes and wooed back the fashion press with high-end catwalk shows. Once the kind of check thing died down, and the brand and the catwalk collection became kind of really popular with the fashion press. They then developed things like their relationship with their customers through Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, all those kinds of like very modern ways of, of kind of communicating with your customer. So it seems Burberry have made themselves cool again. And no one is remotely embarrassed to be seen in it. Behind me, they're just setting up for the Burberry show, which is the biggest show of London Fashion Week. But Burberry is the epitome of understated English style. And this is the ticket that everyone wants to get hold of. Load up your guns and bring your friends. It's fun to lose and to This three million pound extravaganza is all about keeping everybody's eyes firmly fixed on the top of the pyramid. I've seen Sarah Jessica Parker. Even I know she is. I've just got a brilliant feature on the back of her head on my phone. I'm seeing firsthand how a big brand gets its message out. Burberry folks are very kind to invite me, and um, they have been very generous in the past. I've never been to one before, but uh, I like Burberry, so it should be fun. And I can't believe I'm here. I'm so excited. It operates in media on lots of different levels. So yes, those clothes will be shot in Vogue, but yes, that picture of Sarah Jessica Parker will be in the Daily Mirror. I can see now why the super brands want to control their image so carefully and what massive lengths they go to to get the right image in the press. But who's running the show? Them or the magazines? Well, Glamour is the biggest selling women's magazine in the UK and in Europe, I believe, as well. We have about 550,000 readers, people who buy the magazine every month. It's like the most glamorous but also most accessible girlfriend you have. Um, today we're shooting the first story of the season which is um, what we call Hit List, which is um, 12 key looks from the season. The person we have in our head when we're putting the pages together is somebody around 28 years old, probably in a relationship, probably doesn't have children, so therefore um, She's at that prime in her life when most of the money she earns is money she can spend however she wants to spend it. And the brands can try and make her spend a bit on them through advertising, but it's much more effective to be written about. Magazine editorial is great for those brands. The fact that we're saying to them, we love this, is a real sort of badge of honour. This is our little d and look, which is um, really pretty. It's Christian Dior. We've got a Chanel look here, Rana, the stripes. Gucci. Is that machine washable? <laughs> I shouldn't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically, the, 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 these are some of the biggest fashion brands in the world, if Absolutely. not the biggest. Yeah. And it, is it... Why are you ch choosing them? We get so excited when we're going to the Prada show or the yeah. DG show, so that's who, you know, we want to have in this story. So nothing to do with that big, fat advertising budget, then? Fashion magazines need advertising in order to exist. 
but on the same level, fashion brands need the magazines to show the consumer what's available. You know, it's a, it's a kind of two-way relationship. So this magazine is your glamorous girlfriend advising you to spend your disposable income on the top super brands. I like the way you move. Glamour definitely gets people in the shops. I think it's fair to, to say that some of these big ticket designer items actually create a sense of frenzy and excitement that goes beyond sort of being in any way rational about things, which I just can't understand. To try and find out more about these feelings, I'm on my way to Manchester, to a company where if you can't afford to buy that latest IT bag, they'll rent it to you. How much is a bag? Well, something like, say, a Batiga. It's about, um, I would a say about... Yeah, Batiga Veneta, yeah. And it's about £100 to hire this one. To hire it? Yes. So you have to pay £100 to yeah. hire it for a month. Yes. How much would you have to... Well, to, to buy it, it's about £1,500. £1,500? Yes, it looks, yeah. It looks like it's about I know, 30 it's... quid. <laughs> I, I know. Mean, it looks, it, to me, that looks like a uh, very cheap vinyl. Mm. Well, oh, it's not. I mean, it's, it's a brand. It's a, it's a very famous... You know, Italian luxury house. But aren't they, all these manufacturers basically? They're just trying to every six months launch another bag that they want everybody to go crazy for. Well, it's not even six months anymore. It's more like six weeks. Mm. Really? The new bag coming out. So, what are the ones that are the hottest ones? What are the ones that people are desperate to get hold of now? Well, at the moment, it's the the, the, Alexa, Alexa. the Mulberry Alexa, yeah. I would say. So, how long would you have to wait for something like that then, if you were? It was only put on the site the other day because uh, Aditi only bought it the other day and there's already six members waiting for that yeah. bag. Can you describe the feeling that a new must-have handbag and actually getting your hands on it for the first time? I mean, how does that feel? I think it feels really special. You know, it, it's like if there's a really nice car you've seen out on the road and if you were to own it and, you know, drive it out of the garage, I mean, that's exactly the same feeling, yeah, you know. Yeah. I think we ladies get if we go out and buy a really nice handbag. A car. Now I've got a much better idea of what we're talking about. But where do those kind of feelings come from? I mean, is it really just all hype and celebrity endorsement? Or is there something deeper going on inside of us? Time for an experiment. Hannah, can you come with me, please? The person who will administer my experiment is Professor Calvert, an eminent neuroscientist who looks inside people's brains to see why they do things. A large part of our behaviour is actually driven by these brain processes which operate below the level of our awareness. So, so it's, we do things for reasons that we don't even understand ourselves. That's exactly right. Our brains evolved to make us better at surviving and breeding, passing on our genes. One way it did that was to make things like eating and sex feel good. That's done in the limbic system, where we feel things like fear, <gasps> anger, <gasps> pleasure, pain, <gasps> desire. It all happens here. Later on, we develop the intellect. That's the bit where you might think you're making decisions. Make no mistake that, by and large, this rational bit of the brain still services this old emotional mammalian brain. So the old emotional bit is actually driving the new rational bit. It's all about those primeval urges. You could describe it as the, uh, the puppet and the puppet master. I'm going to try and find out what's really going on inside a lady's brain when she gets all hot and sweaty over handbags. Allow me to introduce my guinea pig. I'm Hannah Porter. I'm a student. I study specialist makeup. Hannah loves fashion. She reads all the magazines and loves designer clothes. But at the moment, shops in the high street. Well, she is a student. I'm excited. Really? Yeah, I'd like to see the inside of my head. Hannah is being inserted into an MRI scanner, a machine which can look inside her brain. So we can see what's going on when we show her pictures of handbags. OK, Hannah, we're going to start now. To begin with, some cheap ones. That was, that was shocking. Yeah, that's all right, isn't it? Yes, darling. <laughs> Happy birthday. Then we show Hannah some expensive handbags. See, this 
ventral striatal area. That's her one of her pleasure centres of the brain involved in reward and um, things like craving and addiction. So it's part of the reward network. And that's lighting up when she sees the expensive handbags, but not when she sees the cheap ones. To light up that part of the brain must be any brand's dream, because what we're looking at are Hannah's feelings, which she can't control, even if she wants to. Craving and addiction, so the, the kind of the, 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 the buzz that an addict gets from something that they're addicted to, she's experiencing something akin to that when she's looking at these super luxury brands. Yeah. Really? Good grief. She's not getting that on the cheap and cheerful bands, is she? Clearly not, no. <laughs> But I still don't really get why something that's expensive should trigger such a deep emotion. So I'm back at Louis Vuitton with someone who might be able to explain. This is ostentation and extravagance taken to the ultimate limit. It reminds me a lot of what peacocks do, because what a peacock does with its feathers is to say, look at my extravagant display, look at how rich I am in resources, that I can just squander them and waste them to attract a mate. I'm saying that I have got so much money that it doesn't mean anything to me to spend £10,000 on a handbag. Absolutely. And by having so much money, I become so much more desirable as a mate because I have access to so many, so many resources, which means my genes must be good because to accumulate those resources, I must be intelligent, creative, and all those things that people look for in mates. So basically, they're doing it to get a shag. Yeah. <laughs> Funny thing, but when you realise that the super luxury brands are basically tapping into our instinct to procreate, it certainly makes you uh, look at designer clothes in a whole different light. And the thing is, when you're looking at mainstream brands, they can't rely on that, can they? So, so how are they doing it? I mean, for example, you look around here, everybody's got a pair of jeans on. There's nothing aspirational at all about a pair of jeans. And yet jeans are the most common garment in the world. So how do the jean super brands helm shift over £30 billion worth of denim every year? What are they tapping into? I found a man to tell me about jeans brands who's been studying them for years, although he doesn't actually wear them. Jeans are such an amazing garment. I mean, pretty much everybody's got one all over the world, you know. and and. They're not all that different design-wise, yeah. you know. I mean, we've got all these jeans manufacturers working with the same product, but making, coming from all kinds of different angles in terms of what their message is. All right, so I better start at the beginning. What sort of person would wear Levi's? I think everyone wears Yeah, everyone. I think Levi's is absolutely a reflection of youth rebellion. Oh, well, you can't see a construction person without a pair of Levi's on. What, what sort of things pop into your mind when you think about Levi's? Um, usually um, cowboys. It's just spread to, to every corner of uh, the culture. Levi's have been the world's biggest selling jeans brand for over 100 years. But how did they get there? Levi Strauss was running a shop in San Francisco during the gold rush of the late 1800s when he had the idea of using some fabric he'd imported for making tents to make hard-wearing trousers for the miners. He brought it in from Nîmes in France. De Nîmes, denim, get it? He put rivets in the pockets to stop them tearing and jeans were born. That was pretty much it for 70 years until, just after the Second World War, teenagers were invented. The Western world was coming out of this massive slump um, and all of a sudden there was this exciting new era of people that weren't wearing suits, they were wearing workwear, dating girls and riding motorbikes and all of a sudden um, denim was actually a really cool look. They were incorporating into their message the workwear of the common honest sort of the earth people. It was really kind of ruffling feathers. It's you know similar to me going around my granny's house in a you know, paint spattered overalls with kind of paint on my face, you know, all that kind of thing, that'd be like, I don't care, I'm here. So now, as well as meaning work, jeans and Levi's with them meant rebellion. 
Once rock and roll came along in the 60s, jeans meant peace, skinheads and loads of things. You can tell a lot about somebody just from looking at their jeans. Throughout most of human history, people use their dress to signal their success in life. In the 20th and the 21st centuries, what people started craving and needing was to be able to assert their authenticity. In an ever more marketed and advertised and fake world, what mattered was to say, I'm real. And nothing says I'm real as much as the total history of jeans and denim. In the 1970s, an Italian teenager saw clearly what people wanted from their jeans. Over the next 30 years, he would turn his vision into a billion pound super brand. Clean, Italian, uh, high price point. Young, 20 something or other, nice biting jeans. Funky. Actually, more creative than Levi's. Diesel represents a new phase in what jeans and denim is all about. Back in the 70s, Renzo Rosso saw that people liked their lived-in, ripped, dirty jeans. This knackered legwear had history. So he decided to make off-the-peg history and sell jeans pre-knackered. Diesel understood that there was a message in your choice of trousers. The emphasis here, the hard work, goes into not simply designing a better or more expensive pair of jeans, but designing a really complex and attractive message which is going to appeal to a wide range of customers and which they're going to be willing to pay that bit extra for. Diesel's still owned by Renzo and it's based in his hometown in Italy. This should be a good place to find out about trouser messages. Hello, I'm Alex. Really? Yes. This, this is the international headquarters of Diesel in Italy. We're in one of the areas where they come up with all their latest um, ideas for finishes and designs. There's not a lot we can film because this is cutting edge fashion. We're just waiting for uh, Renzo, the um, creative genius behind Diesel, to come and see us. He's just having his hair done. Hello. Ciao. Buongiorno. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Is it a diesel hat? Yes, of course. Although diesel sell other stuff now, they're still churning out their pre-knackered jeans. I mean, for example, if we look at these jeans here, these look like somebody's had them for about 15 years. I mean, it looks actually like they may have cut themselves, that could be blood or something, I don't know. It sort of it tells a story, like this one could be somebody who's a painter and decorator, for example. Yes. Or in a... In a, a car spray booth or something. Do you look at, you know, inspiration for people in working environments and that sort of thing? Yeah, for example, uh, one uh, that is in the process now is the uh, my gold miners. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, these can be the, 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 the painters, you know. So, so you started in 1978? Yes. What kind of reaction did you get from shops and from distributors? It was uh, very difficult in the beginning because I remember that uh, you send the goods uh, and they, they sent back, they think it was the second quality. <laughs> and it was that. Did, did they think you were mad? Did they think you were a bit crazy to want to sell what appeared to be second-hand Jeans. But you know, I think uh, my, my I consider myself a, a kind of a pioneer and rebel. All my little grow every year was very suffering. I, I cry so many times. You cannot imagine. And uh, uh, now, now after many years, uh, we have an incredible good reputation and consideration in uh, you know, a worldwide market. But in the beginning, was uh, was very tough. But Renzo's not crying anymore. And where he pioneered, others have followed. Now, virtually all jeans brands have lines of distressed or destroyed denim, having them made in Turkey, China, the Philippines, Mexico, or India. Oh, wow. Look at this place. This is, this is incredible. We're in India. Uh, we're just uh, heading towards a, a denim factory that uh, distresses denim and makes it look secondhand. Busy, isn't it? 
I'm finding the whole idea of trouser messages quite strange, so I'm really curious what these people think about them. Yeah, how many jeans are you producing in this factory? Uh, on a monthly basis, we pro uh, produce probably 100 to 150,000 pairs of uh, jeans. So, who, who are the main brands that we might have heard of that, that you make garments uh, for? We manufacture for uh, Gloria Vanderbilt. Yeah. Old Navy, which is a, a part of the Gap Inc. We are all doing developments for diesel. But I'm not here to see jeans being made. I'm here to see jeans being destroyed. My job is to destroy and I can say screw the fabric and make it look good. <laughs> Do you find it slightly strange that you take something that is immaculate and pristine and you totally destroy it? See, uh, it's my hobby, it's my, uh, it's my, uh, what we call, interest. We are doing some work which we like. So, and we find ourselves in doing that work. If you take any garment like this, you put it in your showroom, no one will buy it like this. But they will pay extra for something that looks older yes. and more second hand. Yes, mostly young people, they like garments with more dress look, more vintage look. And once you go a little bit uh, advanced in the age, people, they will reduce. Younger people want their jeans to look older. Yeah. Older people want their jeans to look younger. Yeah. What else can I do but hand my jeans over to this philosopher of denim? First, he gets the sandpaper out and starts a process called whiskering right. to make those white lines that normally come after years of creasing and washing. Then comes the grinding. So what they are doing here, they are grinding, grinding all the edges of the, all right. the garment. So to wear the garment for one year or two years. Yeah. Put in your hand, take in your hand, yeah, put in yeah. your hand. Five minutes will give you the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then more sanding processes to produce holes. Next, it's over to the wet processing area. I like a dark, no, not pink. I don't want pink trousers. Wow. For stone washing and bleaching before heading back to dry land for a final crinkle. So the operation, what he's doing now, he's adjusting the crinkle by hand. The crinkle are created themselves. Every time you get into that position, yeah. I haven't got the time to sit in that position for year after year after year to get a crinkle. That's why this process is so important. It's finished. <laughs> it seems to me that destroying denim is all about pretending. Pretending that you've been through something that you haven't. It's a great example of adding a message to your trousers. And I'm really interested to find out how you get someone to fork out for that kind of thing. This brand behind me seems to mean more about the message than any other brand I've come across so far. Yeah. Basically, their clothes are very, very straightforward and ordinary. But they charge three or four times as much as some of the high street shops. You know, there's absolutely no sign in the shop whatsoever. And yet, people queue around the block to shop here. And why is that man half naked? What's their message? It'll be kind of the in crowd that, you know, kind of kind of gathering all together. Mm, preppy. It looks better on the white person. Yeah, because yeah. the, the way they dress is different. Uh, it, it just sort of projects an image of um, vanity and, and superficiality to me. I love Abercrombie & Fitch, I've just been in there, I've got my stuff time. Abercrombie & Fitch began in 1892 as a posh New York sports outfitter. Abercrombie & Fitch was where Ernest Hemingway kept his guns off-season. But after being taken over in the 1980s, it was stamped with a completely new identity. The only thing they kept was the name and the date. And it is kind of like shopping in a nightclub. When you go into the store, the first thing you're confronted by is the fact that it's quite dark. And the second thing is the fact that all the shop assistants are practically models. Sometimes the, the male models are actually topless. Sometimes they're dancing. This kind of shopping experience is called retail theatre. At Abercrombie, it's all about a highly sexualised look. From the advertising to the shopping bags to the staff themselves. For women, it's kind of sort of slender, athletic. If you're a boy, quite jockish, probably a bit blonde. Remind you of somebody? 
Mr Abercrombie and Fitch don't want to talk to me, but I'm going to get the look anyway and cruise down to see what I can learn. And all the girlies say I'm pretty fly for a white guy. The man responsible for all this theatre is the 66-year-old boss, Mike Jeffries, who seems to be having ever-increasing amounts of plastic surgery to retain the Abercrombie look. I think every sort of mega brand does need some kind of slightly nutterish kind of person in charge of it. You know, that's certainly helps to kind of create an, a, a, a newsworthy brand. Ooh, all right. I get the feeling that Abercrombie want to be seen as exclusive, and I've found some quotes from Jeffries to back this up. In every school there are the cool and popular kids, and then there are the not-so-cool kids. Candidly, we go after the cool kids. We go after the attractive, all-American kid with a great attitude and lots of friends. And every exclusive club knows that the one thing more important than who you let in is who you don't let in. A lot of people don't belong in our clothes and they can't belong. Are we exclusionary? Absolutely. And for the final touch, the scent that they spritz in all the shops. Fierce. <laughs> Starting with the bouncers on the door, the message here is exclusivity. Although in reality, everyone seems to be getting in, no matter how friendless and ugly they may be. They even let me in, although not with a camera. So do people feel ripped off having to pay over the odds for the clothes? It's 80 quid. It's, not much, yeah, it's it a lot is of money exactly. for what it is, isn't it? You know, if it didn't have a logo on and you went to another shop, it would be just as good quality. And you yeah, end up, oh, so why don't you do that? It's not the same. No, it's, not, it's, it's never the same. It's, it's, it's different, but it's not. Well, but why Abercrombie and Fitch? I mean, it's quite standard stuff, isn't it? It's like tracksuit tops and chinos and jeans and... I don't know, it's really popular. It's like, it's, it, you've got to fit in. If you haven't got Abercrombie and Fitch, what would, that, what would, you know, would you be left out or...? A little bit, yeah. Abercrombie and Fitch might be tight-lipped, but I have managed to persuade another ideas brand to let me see the message-making process in action. Superdry are one of the world's fastest growing clothing brands. Their clothes aren't that different to Abercrombie and Fitch, except for the huge variety of distinctive logos and graphics. It seems to me it's a, a, a strange sort of mixture of the, of the American and the Japanese, so it's possibly uh, a Japanese company trying to sort of buy into the post-war America when everything was cool. What do you know about Superdry? Do you know what, what country of origin it is? I would say probably J J Japanese or Japan. Or... I know it's from Japan. Is it Japanese? I'm off to Superdry's global HQ. A bit weird. All the signs are in English. Sadly, no trip to Japan. It turns out that Superdry is English, and they come from an industrial estate just outside Cheltenham. This brand is less than six years old, but in that time they've grown from zero to four hundred million pounds turnover a year. It, it all happened on a plane trip to Tokyo. Yeah. We went to Japan to get some inspiration. We went there looking for clothes and ideas. Yeah. We came back with nothing, but we came back with suitcases full of packaging, street signs, and pop bottles and yeah. noodle packets and anything, literally anything, and it's all super this, super that, and all high impact. I had a little office across the road <laughs> with uh, shelves full of packaging in front of me. Then we started with the T-shirts, five T-shirts and a couple of polos. <laughs> so this weird super dry world is completely made up. So, th so this is where you come up with all the graphics, all the logos? For me, it's all about vintage Americana. Right. I'm obsessed with that. 50s, 60s. I call it sort of garage land culture, uh, petrol stations, forecourt livery, hot rod magazines, all that kind of thing. This was a very early one I did. And when that eventually went into store, it became an instant number one bestseller. Right. And James and I went, yes, let's do more of that. Everything we do here is hand rendered. And I, I work in a very old school way. A bit of Japanese text in here. What does that say? That. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, that says crankshafts in Japanese. Wow. It's amazing, isn't it? If you look at the sort of great youth cultures of the world, um, that basically there's, there's Britain, yeah. there's America, and there's Japan. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've done, or what James has done, is, is brilliantly sort of <laughs> meld the, the sort of cool aspects of it all. Yeah. And, and, and so Superdrive was created. 
So what have I learned so far? You could say that luxury brands were about buying your way up the social ladder. And jeans or American vintage clothing are about keeping it real. By buying a piece of a 50s American fantasy world where everyone's a mechanic. Well, if we all more or less understand this language of brands, when does it start? I'm talking to a group of 10 and 11 year olds to get some more info. I'm just going to hold up some, some pictures to you and I want you to tell me if you recognise it and what it is. Okay. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Two C's. Burberry? Who? Burberry. Have you heard of Burberry? A burglar. Burglar. <laughs> okay, so maybe it's not fair to do luxury brands. Yeah. Tell me, what sort of person you think would, would wear Levi's? <laughs> okay, diesel. Um, petrol. But of course, there's a huge section of the clothing market I haven't even touched yet, and some of the world's biggest super brands. Okay, you ready? Adidas. 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 Nike. 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 Obviously. These brands are in our heads in a way the others can only Nike. dream of. Jackets, trousers, tracksuits. Mm. So what's their secret? Apparently, Adidas sales are about double what Levi's sales are, for example, and Nike sales are about three times as much. Part of it has got to be the amount of money that they spend on, on marketing. I've seen how important advertising is to fashion brands, but these brands take it to a whole new level. Because Adidas spend £900 million a year, and Nike £1.6 billion. I'm going to see some people who make it their business to study Nike's advertising. Adbusters try to take the global brands on at their own game and spoof their advertisements with subvertisements. Hello, are you Lauren? No, I'm Twyla. They've used the Nike logo as part of their corporate stars and stripes. They object to what they see as the world takeover by mega brands, although I can't help noticing that not everyone is quite on message. Logo is. Nice. Why are you wearing a brand, what's, Kevin? What's all that about? Was, is that, <laughs> are you being ironic or something? Very, very ironic. Are you, what's... Kevin's a volunteer, so he's in training, yeah. so... He's not been through the programme. No, yeah. no, exactly. He's not had his mind changed. I wanted to get their take on these mega-budget ad campaigns. Well, I think the, the power of, of, uh, of brands, especially mega-brands, comes from their ability to build a kind of a nuclear glow around their brand. And they spend uh, days, weeks. I used to be in the advertising industry, so I know that really? the, they they spend sometimes months, and they sp and they pay some marketing whiz kids, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars, to decide what emotion can we take and and put around our brand. Is it going to be empowerment? Is it going to be homeliness? Is it going to be love? Is it going to be sexiness? Uh, the Nike brand is a good example of that. They, they have this, <coughs> this nuclear glow that says empowerment. You wear Nikes and you're going to be stronger, you're going to be cooler, you're going to be better in some way. And, and that is the secret of their power, the fact that they, they have managed to tap into uh, an emotion that is central to our lives. And they've been able to place their brand right there where it hurts, if you like. <laughs> yeah. And it goes way beyond billboards and glossy TV ads. At the school, I saw the power of another method of placing your brand where it hurts. Some city fans saw Tevez wearing Nike boots. They'd, go, they'd beg their mums for Nike boots and things. And then they'd go to school and go, I'm wearing the same boots as Tevez. Right, I see. So getting your boots on the feet of the right people is especially important for this age group. What sort of person you think would, would wear Adidas? I think it's time to go play with the big boys. From fashion forward, all the way through the demographic, I would say. Super cool. Really sporty. This funky, young, sexy again. Chevy, I can do. I'm on my way to the headquarters of Adidas. Uh, number one, Adi Dassler Strasse. The roots of Adidas lie in the Dassler Brothers Shoe Factory. Founded in 1928 by brothers Adi Dassler, a brilliant sports shoemaker, and Rudy Dassler, a clever businessman. 
Dassler brothers survived the Second World War by making boots for the German army. But in 1946, they fell out and set up rival shoe businesses. Puma from Rudy Dassler and Adidas from Adidasler. They never spoke again. Ah, oh, look, factory outlet, Adidas, there on the horizon. And look, just over there, there's a massive Puma building. Apparently for years, even the workers didn't speak to each other. I'm not exactly a sportsman, but I reckon I could be good for Adidas. You see, what I could do if I was in Dawson, I could come down here, get some pictures taken, uh, go around the running track, like that, you know, maybe have a party with some other celebrities or something, and uh, that would be great business, great PR for Adidas. These are the different brands they also have in the Adidas group. Adidas, Adidas, Adidas and Adidas. Reebok, CCM, TaylorMade, Adidas, Ashworth and Rockport. Isn't that a type of cheese? I'm being taken to the brand centre where Adidas train their employees. There's a big thing up there that we can't film. It's totally secret and uh, commercially sensitive. But it's amazing. Really, <laughs> it goes on and on. <sighs> Clever. <sighs> their in-house historian has agreed to take me to a room even many of the employees don't know exists. Why don't you try to open the door? Just... I feel a bit like uh, Indiana Jones. Is this where the, the tomb of yeah. Adi Dassler? Try it out. Find out. Oh, my goodness. <gasps> this room contains a shoe with more history than any other shoe I've ever met. <laughs> would you I would love to get the, the, the gloves on if we, we show that. 1936 was the year of Adolf Hitler's Berlin Olympic Games. But Hitler's plans to demonstrate Aryan racial supremacy were upset by a black American athlete, Jesse Owens. Owens. This is one of the shoes that were worn by Jesse Owens in the 1936 Olympics. Adi Dassler had spotted the publicity value of Owens before the Olympics. And so he talked to Jesse and we know the rest of the history. Lutz Long's last jump. Also 7.87 metres, a new European record. And now the amazing Owens again. Eight point more six metres. A new world's record. When Jesse Owens won four gold medals wearing Adidasler's shoes, the company, not yet called Adidas, hit pay dirt. And it was a major boost for the business. They produced, after that, a lot of shoes for different sports. That is an actual pair that Jesse Owens wore to win gold at the 1936 Olympics. Gosh. Have you got the left? And over the years, Adidas have pushed this idea of endorsements way beyond sport. You know, they have a seeding program, various sort of you know, people in and around sort of you know, various cultures, you know, music artists, you know, street artists. They try to target and identify those key players, get them wearing it, and then get it seen out and about. Ooh. Yeah. I've got a meeting with the man responsible for giving free Adidas gear to trendy people. I'm sure he'll recognise a trendsetter when he sees one. I, I look upon Adidas as an iconic credible brand so we wanted to associate ourselves with iconic credible people yes so how do you keep it fresh then how do you make sure that you're endorsing the people that you know younger people than you will be interested in a good example would be probably about 2003 a friend of mine who adopted a young lad and I went round there and him and his right. mates were talking about MCs and DJs and I had absolutely no clue about any of these people they were talking about don't you know Yo. don't you don't you no. you know what they were listening to now has kind of turned you know has, has been labelled as grime who wants to be a millionaire who wants to be a millionaire and so I made it my business to find out about what it was that they were listening to and who the people were within that scene. And when we started to provide products to those kids, a lot of those kids couldn't believe that a corporation was even aware of who they were. Bashy, big beard, well done, respect. A lot of these kids that we're talking about are now, you know, having number one records. And oh, number one. 
But w were they actually wearing Adidas before you started? Well, not really. No blue suede shoes, just my Adidas trainers, but I'm still rock and roll. I mean, are you looking for anybody, you know, maybe in the TV business? For example, BBC Three, I don't know if you, you, you've watched BBC Three. Very cool demographic. Wouldn't it be a good idea to maybe get involved with uh, somebody who the people on BBC Three think is cool? Like me, for example. Do you want to talk numbers? Maybe just the just the trainers. I don't want to. I don't want to paint you into a corner, Gary. But to be honest, you know, there's other people. Is this, is this, like, people, is this really there's happening? Other people out here. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I am hot. What do you think? Um. God bless you. Thanks. Unbelievable. How are they ever going to regain their number one status when they pass up an opportunity like that? But interestingly, despite all this multi-million dollar power to get inside our minds, even the biggest brand has to be careful, because things can go wrong very quickly. I find Nike as a super brand particularly interesting because they mean everything to everyone, but that everything isn't the same message. Everyone from like probably like rap stars to sports people, everyone wears Nike. I have Nike sneakers. The mass, 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 mass market. They transcend being on the high street to being to verging on luxury to verging on super technical. Even things. see tramps wear Nike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nike started in 1964 as Blue Ribbon Sports, founded by a college athlete, Phil Knight, and his coach, Bill Bowerman. They were in at the start of the new jogging boom and helped develop it, at first importing, then designing and manufacturing their own jogging shoes. And they had an advantage over the others. Right from the start, their business model was to use cheap labour to make shoes in developing countries and save on costs. But pictures of bad working practices and illegal conditions started to leak out in the 1990s. We told them how workers have been forced to sew clothes seven days a week. We told them about the compulsory overtime, the harassment, and of course, about the child labour. There was a backlash against Nike products. Brands, like religions, have values. So if we see ourselves as being the kind of person that believes what Levi's believes or believes in the values of Louis Vuitton or believes in the values of Nike, then those are the brands we will wear to display our traits to the world. If they go against those values, then you will lose your association with them. Which explains the lengths Nike have gone to to be seen to be dealing with these issues. And I've discovered another reason Nike would want to clean up their image in the developing world. Because in these countries where the scandals happened, Nike stores are now popping up like mushrooms. I want to see for myself why Nike is so hot to trot there. This is the morning rush hour in Chennai, which is in the southeast of India, and is the uh, third fastest growing city on earth. Hundreds of motorbikes, quite a few of the blokes riding the motorbikes don't have shoes on. What a great opportunity to sell trainers. And over there is a uh, big Nike store. Shit, shit, what are we doing? What are we... Ah! I'm wondering if any of the labour scandals have affected how people think of Nike here. Did that have any negative impact on the brand in this country? No, I don't think so. See, interesting part was when all the scandals came in, that time there was nothing called social networking sites. Right. Right? And that was not a hype in India. Okay. And in today's scenario, for the social networking site and blogging, this is becoming so fast spreading in India. Also, I can't guarantee you that a brand which is having scandal can stay back in India. So they have to be especially careful of their image here. But it's a different one to the one I recognize. See, if you see, this lady, she is a typical Nike customer. Right. right? She is coming out in a chauffeur driven car and she knows what kind of product she wants. Yeah. Right, so this is a typical customer for those brands which is catering to the creamy layer. She has a driver, she's sitting in the yes, back. Yes, she has the driver. She's at the sort of income level that would be the yes. person who would shop at yes, night. Yes, yes, If you've got to walk it, you can't afford it. Is that the, is right. that the idea? Right. <laughs> So Nike's an exclusive brand over here, and only a tiny percentage of the population can afford it. But as there are over a billion people in India, that tiny fraction is a cool 50 million punters and growing fast every day. ka -ching. And what about the 950 million who currently can't afford it? 
here on this minibus, there's uh, Nike logos all across the windows. A handcrafted Nike swoosh. You have to really like a brand to go through all this trouble to own its logo. Each individual one is subtly different from the one next to it. And it's not just Nike. Do you, do you prefer branded yeah, things? Yeah, we prefer branded things. It's not original Puma, it's a duplicate of Puma. And uh, it is cost uh, 100 rupees only. Buying a fake means you don't even get an assurance of quality. The most basic thing you expect from a brand. Fakes really are all about the message. If you, if you had enough money, would you go to the Puma shop and get the... So finally, in India's new shopping malls, catering for those people lucky enough to be able to afford originals, I found what I was looking for. I found the real secret of the fashion super brands. Or did I find it here at the fakes market? Levi's. Where you can buy different levels of fakes to fit your budget. That's, color, but, uh, that's quite convincing, isn't it? Actually, I found it in both. Burberry. Burberry. Because the secret of the fashion super Louis brand... Vuitton. I think it's a Louis Vuitton hat, that chap's got. Is that they offer something so universal... Levi's. Levi's. Nike. No. Nike. That everyone at all layers of society wants it. Adidas. Whether they can afford it or not. Adidas. And that's why Nike expect the emerging markets to push their profits up by over £2 billion a year. Why Adidas will be opening nearly two stores every day for the next five years in China. Why Burberry's Asian sales climbed 68% last year. So where does the secret power of the fashion super brand come from? It comes from us. Next time, I'll be sniffing around the secretive world of the food super brands. You're not going to get this recipe, Alex, however hard you try. I'll knock on the doors of the global grubmongers to see how they got to be such a big part of our lives. Oh, I'll cater your price, man. It's are. everywhere, but you're sick of it. I want to know where they came from. The past no longer exists. Everything is Red Bull brand. Of it is the definitive brand and what they've got in store for us. We're going to double this business in 10 years. You're going to double it. And there are more secrets of the super brands exposed here on BBC HD at the same time next week. Next tonight, it's the world accordion to Phil.